Confidentiality, integrity, availability, CIA. In the past two modules of COVID cryptography, we've been looking at confidentiality and encryption. In this module, we're going to be looking at something much more important, integrity, and I'm going to show you why. Hello, I'm Philip Pound Baker, and this module is all about message digests. Uh, why do we need message digests? Well, this goes right back to the early history of the web, just after the second web conference. There was a meeting at MIT at which the uh, SSL 1.0 protocol was presented in public for the first time. And the presentation did not go well. In fact, the protocol was broken in less than 10 minutes. And the reason for that was it didn't have any integrity checks in it. Um, and this is a really big problem if what you're trying to do is to enable internet commerce, which is what SSL was all about. So what's the vulnerability here? Well, let's say that Alice is sending messages to Bob, who's her banker and she's going to use SSL 1.0. And Mallet is sitting in the middle between Alice and Bob. Uh, he, he has control of one of the routers. And Mallet can change the data flowing between Alice and Bob, but he can't read the plain text. He can only read the cipher texts. However, Alice and Bob are going to use a stream cipher. So if Mallet can guess the plain text correctly, or he can make a modification that's guaranteed to make Bob make Mallet money. Um, Mallet can uh, change the output. So um, what's going to happen here is that uh, Alice is going to pay uh, Mallet uh, uh, an invoice of say a hundred dollars that was due, and Mallet knows this and waits for Alice to send a message to the bank. And when the message comes across, Mallet takes the transaction message, which is a standardized format he, he can guess, and he changes the amount from $100 to $99. Why can he do that? Well, it's a stream cipher. So if he knows that the amount of the check is $100, he can work out the cipher stream for just those bytes and then he can substitute his own bytes and you know since um since any number is greater than one it he doesn't even need to get it completely correct you know he, he, he even if you use a block cipher you can still manipulate the data flowing from alice to bob it's just that he's not going to know exactly how much money he's going to be able to steal by using this so um, if you don't have integrity, you've not got any security. Um, being able to manipulate the amount of the transactions is a lot more serious than somebody being able to see what those transactions were. And of course, another thing that uh, Mallet can do, uh, only he would need to know the, um, the, 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 uh, the cipher stream for, would be uh, he could change the account to which the check is going to be payable. You know, he could make it so that it was going to be a, um, a payment to Carol, and now he's made it to Alice. So these attacks are really serious. If you don't get integrity right, you've not got any security. And the technique that we use to protect integrity in um, SSL and TLS is what's called a message authentication code. And this is very similar to a message digest. A message digest, let's recall, has a single input and a fixed length output. A message authentication code has a fixed length output, but it has two inputs. The first input is the content that is going to be authenticated, and the second input is a key. And in fact, these are sometimes called keyed digests because a lot of the constructions that we use for message authentication codes are key, do make use of message digest, but the proper term of art is message authentication code. And that's important because we don't just construct these from message digest. We can actually use a block cipher as well. And I'll show you how we do that. One of the important applications of message authentication 
functions, it meshes authentication codes, is as a passcode authenticator. And you've probably seen these in use. Um, so, you know, here we've got a little token and there's a number that changes once a minute. Uh, it's four digits, six digits, eight digits. And the story I was told about where these came from was that originally the idea was that these were going to be given out to a security guard. Uh, if you're hiring security guards, you know, particularly if they're going to work at night, you know, how do you know that they're actually doing their job? You know, do you have to hire another security guard to watch them? Well, that doesn't work either because if you've got two security guards, then they're going to both be sitting in uh, the cabin watching TV together. So what the idea was that uh, you have this, uh, uh, this code and it would, the number would change once a minute and there would be um, sheets, time sheets, that the guard had to fill in at each stop in his rounds um, and that would be, allow the manager to check that the guard was doing their job without having to check up on them personally. Well, at least that's the story I was told. Uh, whether that's true or not, you know, there's a lot of mythology that goes on. So these are used for uh, authenticating people uh, to computers. Um, if you've got a VPN access to your work computer, it's quite likely something like this where you have a time code uh, that's changing every minute, or some of them have a button that you press uh, and that creates a new code. Um, this, uh, this is a, an example of a bank card um, so this actually has liquid paper. It's a standard uh, bank card, meets all the uh, bendiness and twistiness uh, uh, criteria from the uh, specification. Um, and it's got a little one-time authenticator. Uh, and as you can see, both of mine aren't producing any uh, numbers anymore because the batteries have all uh, run down. So they're robust. And they do actually overcome one of the biggest problems with um, passwords, which is the passwords cannot be written down because they're going to change every time they're used. Um, you know, whether you use a time or a uh, button to uh, advance a counter, uh, the code is going to change every time. Um, the problem with them is not, not particularly secure though. I mean, like we've got here, we're reducing the password itself to eight digits, which is only equivalent to a 26 bit key. And the thing that's got me even more is these days you're liable to have a passcode authenticator app on your mobile phone or maybe your uh, smartwatch. And that's really convenient, but there's only one problem here. Here we have a pocket supercomputer. It's got a really great display. It's got a keyboard. It's connected to a network 24 hours. And we're using it to emulate a device that was from the pocket calculator era of computing. You know, these came out in the 1970s when being able to produce a pocket calculator was bleeding edge technology. So I don't think that we're really using um, them to, the technology to its best advantage. I've got some proposals how to change that and we'll come to those in a later module um, as part of the mesh. Okay, so how do they work? Well, um, you can use a message digest, uh, uh, a message authentication code, or we can use a um, AES block cipher. But what we're gonna do is we're gonna have two parts. One, we're going to have a key that is going to be unique to the device. It's going to be inserted into the device during manufacture and never leave. And then we're going to take a copy of that uh, key, uh, obviously before we insert it, and we're going to give that to a key service that is going to be able to check the passcodes that are presented. And then to produce each passcode, we have a changing input. So the input could be time, or it could just be a counter that advances each time we press the button. So each time we get a different input, same key produces a different output. 
and then we shorten that to four, six, eight, or however many digits we need. And to implement one of these, uh, because we've got a very short input, um, we can just use AES as uh, our um, message to authentication code because you know the input is less than the AES block cipher size. In fact, we can even use DES. I mean, like it really doesn't matter. These are only giving us a 26-bit work factor anyway. Uh, and you know, if we're using time, well, 64 bits, that's enough for 136 years, uh, ticking every second. So, yeah. But we, So that's how you do it well. There are also some people who do it badly. Really, really badly. And these people are, are, are using them for an even more security uh, uh, sensitive application, at least as far as I'm concerned. I mean, like accessing my employer's VPN. I mean, like, why should I care? I mean, like, it's my employer's money. My car uses exactly the same technology for authentication with one difference. Instead of using a strong authentication system, instead of using AES or HMAC, which I'll go into in a moment, uh, they use a system, most, almost all of them use a system called Keylock, which was broken in 2015. And also 10 years earlier, and also 10 years before that. I, basically, uh, there's a time period. Uh, you can recycle your key lock break uh, papers for uh, security conferences because after 10 years, they're still using the same broken cipher, but the things are still in uh, use. And they're used to uh, secure you know, really expensive $100,000, $200,000 cars use this broken cipher. Um, and so, you know, when you hear people talking about rolling codes, making the garage door secure, no, they don't. In fact, when I was pairing up my uh, Toyota to the uh, car door opener, the way that I did it was I pressed the button on the radio control opener uh, three times and the car ran the cryptanalysis routine to work out what the seed, what the key of the message authentication code was. And that's how bad the uh, system is. Uh, the attacks are now part of the infrastructure. Okay, but you know, hey, door locks aren't a, aren't a very, aren't a big security concern, are they? Uh, you know, using electronic lock, Nobody's worried about the security of locks. Okay, so message authentication codes are useful, but you've got to use them right. And so let's see how you can go wrong, even when you're using a strong cipher. So what we're going to look at is a simple key digest. And the rule here is that we're going to start by writing our key out to the buffer, and then we're going to append the text to be authenticated to the end of the message. And the output, or you know, the message authentication code, that depends on every byte of the input, which proves that the key was to use to generate it, right? Well, no, it doesn't. And to understand why, we've got to look into the details of how that message digest function is implemented. Um, if we're using SHA-2 or SHA-1 or MD5 or MD4, they're all part of a family called merkle dangard construction. And what they are doing is they're constructed in a similar way to a block cipher. Uh, and what, they, what we have is we start off with an initialization vector, which is fixed by the specification. And then we put the input blocks, we uh, peel off uh, 512 bits at a time, and we feed that into our block function, and that produces an output. And then we do it again, and we do it again, and we do it again, each time feeding the out last output into the input. And all the inputs and outputs are the same width as the output. So if we're using SHA-2 in 256-bit mode, the input and the output will be 256 bits. 
And so what this means is that we can have an extinction attack. Uh, what we do is um, the last uh, block, when, we, when we're processing the last block, there's a few rules to use to pad out that block in a specific way uh, to fin finalize the message digest. However, these are fixed rules uh, that are known to an attacker. So if the attacker knows the initial, uh, knows how long the uh, message, they can then restart the message authentication code. They know the output. They can just add on as many blocks as they want. And that actually ends up being a really serious attack. It's called an extension attack. Alice generates a message. She authenticates it with a key, sends the result to Bob. Bob intercepts the message and adds on these extra uh, blocks onto the end of the message. He doesn't know what's inside the message if it's encrypted, but he can append his blocks to the end. Now, why Bob receives a message, checks the message authentication code, and assumes that that's exactly what Alice sent. Now, why is this serious? Uh, well, it's serious because most uh, archive formats like zip or whatever, uh, they all have an index uh, that says what files are in the archive. So if I'm going to send you uh, 50 files uh, from my machine, the easy way of doing it is to use zip or some or tar or whatever. I zip the files up and send you that message. Now, because zip is designed in such a way that you can add files to a zip file after you've created it, they put the index to all the files at the end. So that then if you want to just add a few files to the end, you can just chop off the old index, write the additional file to the end, and then put a new index on. So that what that means is that Mallet can add the files he wants to overwrite in the archive to the end of the archive, and then put his own index on the end pointing to his files rather than the originals. And what this means is that Mallet can now install malware on the machine. So, you know, you, if message authentication codes are useful, but you've got to construct them right. Uh, one example of doing it the right way is HTTP Digest authentication. Uh, well, I hope it's the right way. I mean, this is actually the very first cryptographic protocol I ever designed. Um, and it makes use of multiple digests that are nested one inside the other. Uh, now, I, I'll say at the outset, you know, this is a product of its era. Do not use HTTP Digest authentication. Um, well, passwords are rotten form of authentication for a start. Um, it was, this authentication mechanism was designed in an era where public key cryptography was still encumbered. And so I had to make a couple of design choices that you don't need to make today. There are better ways of doing digest authentication. In particular, I had to make a choice between defeating phishing attacks. That's where somebody steals usernames and passwords off the web and uh, storing the password on the server in a form that would allow an attacker to read it. And that's just, if you've not got public key cryptography, which we'll come to next, um, you've got to make that choice. Uh, it's just inherent in the system. Uh, I, I chose to defeat phishing attacks. Uh, the market decided that they were much more concerned about keeping the password on the machine. And the result is history. I mean, uh, digest authentication uh, it's in the HTTP spec, but it's not in the HTML spec. And that's where most of the usernames and passwords are now passed. So, so the idea of digest authentication is to stop uh, somebody from putting up bogus login screens. This was also before JavaScript came along and reared its ugly head. Uh, so the idea of a phishing attack is uh, an attacker puts up a bogus login screen, the user enters the username and password, and now the attacker knows the username and password. So 
the idea here is uh, Alice is going to prove that she knows the password without revealing the password. So the way that we do that is that we start off with uh, two inputs into, sorry, three inputs into a digest function. The first is going to be a digest of the username, server name, and the password. And this is going to be the value that is stored in the um, password database on the server. Um, and because of the way that uh, message authentication codes work, if that value leaks, uh, then Mallet can uh, log into that server. But he can't log into other servers because we change the password, uh, we change that value for every server because we constructed uh, the, the first hash uh, from the server name in part. Okay, so this is going to be used to prove that Alice knows the password. So Alice tries to access a web page, and the first thing the server will say is uh, authentication required. Here's a nonce, and a nonce is a piece of data that is used once for some cryptographic purpose. It's a random number that's just going to be used once. And then what Alice is going to send back is the message digest of um, the hash of the password, the nonce and a second hash of the resource that Alice is trying to uh, access. And so this nested digest construction prevents the extension attack because whatever Alice tries to send, uh, well, it's a fixed length um, uh, input for a start, but it, it prevents uh, Mallet from doing an extension attack because the server's going to check uh, the uh, values correct on the other end. So, um, so nested digests are a powerful construct. They defeat the extension attack. Now, HTTP digest, according to our current understanding, is still secure, even if you use MD5. That said, do not use it, because if you use MD5, well, unless you're implementing HTTP, of course, when you've got to implement it because of the password specification. But, um, but, you know, using message digest authentication, you know, using obsolete crypto algorithms uh, is clown suiting. You know, you don't turn up for an interview in a clown suit. You look ridiculous. You don't use obsolete crypto. There are better approaches that are informed by math. And one in particular is HMAC, which was uh, invented by uh, Mihir Belair, Rankinetic and uh, uh, Hugo uh, Kreitzik. Um, and the idea here is that we're going to start, we're going to do this nested digest construction, but we're going to use two different keys. We're going to start with our key and we're first of all going to XOR it with one bunch of data. And then we're going to take the uh, key and we're going to XOR it with another bunch of data. And so we have an inner key and an outer key and the two keys are different and what we do is that we start off our message digest our first message digest function we fill the ipad the, the input padding key into the inner key in at the start of the message and then the message that we're going to digest and we get an output and we then took that take that output we put that at the start of the message we take the outer key and we take the message digest of that. So what HMAC allows us to do is to take our existing message digest function and very efficiently turn it into a message authentication function without having to change any of the innards of the cryptographic algorithm, which is really important if you're trying to do this with trustworthy hardware because you can't change the details of those uh, implementations. There is just one issue I do not like about HMAC, and that is it doesn't distinguish between the key that you selected and your key padded out with zeros. And guess how I found this out? You know, I, I was, uh, I, it's just bizarre. You know, it would be much better if the inner padding and the outer padding were chosen in such a way that 
um, the stuff that uh, isn't uh, mapped to a key uh, just gets uh, treated differently in some way. So the inner key and the outer key would be completely different. But, you know, hey, sometimes you win and sometimes you lose. Okay, so the standard workhorse for the industry is HMAC, uh, HMAC SHA 2 256 bit. And it's fast, it's almost as fast as SHA 2 256 bit. Um, that's the workhorse. But you can also use, and you sometimes come across, message authentication codes that are constructed from a block cipher. And there's actually nothing in this block, in, in this bag of methods that I would generally recommend because there are many, many failed attempts at doing this and you, you really want to avoid that. Uh, there are some secure ones. There's GMAC and there's Poly 1035 AES, uh, but I wouldn't use those either. And the reason for that is that while those are sound approaches as far as we're aware, they've morphed into something else. And that something else is authenticated encryption. So confidentiality, integrity, availability, uh, this uh, uh, module, we're talking about integrity. Well, what if you want confidentiality and integrity? Um, how do you use encryption and a message authentication code? And here we get to some really long-winded and problematic uh, discussions in that whether you should sign and encrypt or encrypt and then sign, there are some very, very firm opinions on both sides. And the correct way, of, there is a correct way of doing it, but they're both wrong. You want to do both. You want to do your integrity and then encrypt and then do your integrity again. But we'll come to that when we do public key. So people, when they try and do authenticated encryption for themselves, there's some, some subtle ways that you can get it wrong. So for example, if somebody's trying to do their DIY encrypt a message authentication code, one of the ways that people often come unstuck is they apply the message authentication code to the ciphertext but forget that the initialization vector is also a part of the input. If you change the initialization vector, well, the decrypted data will change entirely. And so you can perform certain uh, protocol attacks by manipulating the initialization vector if it's not covered by the message authentication code. And so this led to people saying, well, what we really want to do is to bundle up the two systems together so that when somebody is calling encrypt and Mac, and then Mac, if they call it as one, they will always do the right thing. And so there are, other, there are some other problems. You, you can use a weak Mac uh, that's subject to extension attacks. Uh, failure to separate the keys is another one. If you use the same key for your message authentication code and for your encryption, and there is a fault in one algorithm, well, that fault is then going to propagate through and allow somebody to tap the key for the other. And quite often what you find is that somebody's used a weak um, uh, message authentication code construction, and so if that can be undone, the attacker can work out the key. And now they can decrypt the message as well. So don't do it DIY. Um, this is stuff that you, you really need to understand what you're doing. And one good way of doing that is to use authenticated encryption. Now there are a couple of, there are some good ones and there's some bad ones out there. I'm gonna go through just uh, two of the good ones. Uh, the one that we use that uh, is the current fa fa favorite is uh, called Gawa counter mode. Uh, this is an extension of the counter mode I presented in the block cipher piece. Uh, and it's named after uh, Evaniste uh, Gawa. And who was he? Well, he was the French Hamilton. No, not the racing driver. 
that would be Prost. No, he was uh, a revolutionary, uh, you know, post-revolutionary France uh, when they were trying to get rid of the emperor the second time. Uh, and like ha the American Hamilton, they both died in duels. Uh, and Galois was uh, fantastically precocious. Uh, he invented group theory and did a whole range of really astonishing things despite dying at 20. Um, and you know, what he would have done if he'd have uh, lived is uh, you know, one of those unknowns of history. So how do we implement GCM mode? Well, one of the differences between um, authenticated encryption mode and regular encryption modes is we have a thing called unencrypted authenticated data because usually the span of what we want to authenticate is not quite the same as the span of what we want to encrypt. Everything that is encrypted we want to authenticate but there's usually a bit more that we want to authenticate as well and so we start off by uh, running what's called unencrypted authenticated data through uh, our digest mode. It's called ghash and the DET, and that's where we use our Galois theory to construct a digest compression function. Why do we do that? Well, it allows us to provide a provable level of security um, and also have a lot of speed. What it doesn't allow us to do is to have a particularly large block uh, length. Okay, so uh, we take the last output. So, so, so we, we, we've got that. We, we've fed our unencrypted authenticated data through the uh, hash function. And then we encrypt all our data using counter mode. And we take the ciphertext and we put that through our hash function as well and chain all those blocks across and then after we've done all that and we come to the end of our data we put the whole the output through the hash function again to um to prevent an extension attack and the result is an authentication tag so it's a powerful way of authenticating but it's giving us a limited output we're only getting 128 bits of authentication, which is which is a sufficient work factor for a 128-bit block cipher. It isn't an uh, an acceptable work function for um, other things that we'd use message authentication because for, and it's certainly not acceptable for um, message digests. So how do we construct that uh, hash function? Well, this is where we use multiplication in uh, the Galois field, uh, which I'm going to treat as a black box function as far as this presentation goes. Uh, we will come back to uh, Galois theory uh, later on in uh, probably a, a much further, more advanced course. Uh, so we're treating it as a black box function, just like we treated the hash functions of SHA-2 and SHA-3 as black box functions. So it provides us with that 128 bit, 2 to the power 128 bit work factor. It's generally sufficient. And in many cases, we use even shorter tags because if we're only authenticating one uh, packet at a time, uh, we may not need a work factor of 2 to the power 128 on each packet because there's a whole bunch of them. Uh, we may only uh, want the high work factor after all the data has been transferred and then we might have a secondary um, integrity check over the whole uh, whole message you know which might be megabytes and that might use a digital signature or some other technology entirely okay so GCM is the current favorite for use in open standards However, there is one uh, alternative that a lot of people are very interested in, and that is offset codebook mode. And this is something that uh, the field will become extremely interested in, I predict, after July of 2021, which is when the patent expires. Uh, one of the features of cryptography is you know, there are patents. 
And so if people are using encumbered technology, that makes it very difficult to use in an open standard. Um, even if the licensing to, you know, it's not necessarily a question of money. If I've got to involve lawyers in negotiating the use of some function, well, that's a lot more hassle for me as an engineer than using an alternative that doesn't require lawyers. So, you know, it's the total cost of ownership. Lawyers are expensive. But, you know, on the other hand, you know, I make my living as an expert witness in patent uh, defenses. So, as an expert witness. So, yeah. So, off book code book mode is a drop in replacement for GCM mode, uh, but it doesn't reduce our block cipher to a stream cipher. Uh, as I mentioned before, uh, GCM mode is the encryption. Uh, we're essentially just using counter mode. In fact, we are just using counter mode. So our encryption that we're getting from GCM mode is simply a stream cipher encryption. And so you've got the same fragility issues from the use of a stream cipher um, that you're trying to avoid from using authenticated encryption. Uh, and, and so a lot of people um, are not too... Uh, comfortable with that. So uh, offset codebook mode, OC OCM. Uh, you want to be using OCM3, which is a direct drop-in replacement. Uh, and it, it's very similar to, the authentication is very similar to the um, GCM mode. The difference is that instead of doing his field theory just in one part, or just in the authentication part, he uses the field theory piece as his encryption um, solution as well. So it's an interesting cipher and we'll come back to that later on. So in summary, Mac functions, they're important and useful and they're you know probably one, you know they are after message digest, they're really the most important cryptographic function uh, today. Uh, the most common mode that we use is HMAC SHA2 256 bit. Uh, my personal preference is always to use the 512-bit uh, version. Um, you can use, uh, you can encrypt and do message authentication separately. We can, there are also uh, schemes that do them both at the same time, and they're called authenticated encryption. And the current go-to is GCM, but uh, OCM is coming up. So. Uh, that's uh, message authentication codes, and that really completes uh, our introduction to the techniques of symmetric key cryptography. Uh, we've, at this point, we've got all we need as far as data processing goes to build applications. We've got encryption for our confidentiality and message authentication codes for integrity. But we're still missing a few things, and in particular, we need a method of distributing keys. Uh, and so in the next module, we're going to be talking about uh, using symmetric cryptography to distribute keys and a system called Kerberos and also a technology called key derivation functions. And we're also going to be talking about another way of distributing keys, which um, involves what was once called the most splendid floating, sorry, the most splendid floating gin palace in history. So please stick, uh, please join us for that. Uh, please click like and please subscribe and please come back to the next module of Coddled Cryptography. Thank you.